Uh, welcome to the Design Thinking Masterclass, part of STEM Central Commercialization Bootcamp. Um, we're very happy to be part of this um, program here at Design Factory Melbourne, part of Swinburne University. So my name is Christine Thong. I'm the Academic Director here at Design Factory Melbourne. Uh, my background is industrial design and doing research with material science to translate that to commercial applications. Um, I'm going to be one of your facilitators today and talking you through some stuff. We also have here Paulina Matala, who is the Design Factory Coach, um, which has a rather large role of supporting the culture for innovation and the different mindset and working styles to apply design thinking, um, as well as doing a whole range of um, design thinking activities herself with a background in engineering and business management. We also have uh, Nicole Symington, who is a design researcher studying her PhD here with us um, in the area of um, health and how basically we can start to use service design and design thinking style approaches to improve patient experience and have um, holistic, a holistic outlook on things. And we also have uh, Maria Mikkonen, who has a background similar to Paulina with business management and is an entrepreneur who um, has founded a, a startup, uh, 20 Knots, over in, in Finland. So there's the four of us here that will be talking you through um, this design thinking masterclass, which is quite exciting that it is part of Innovation Week and a huge number of wonderful sponsors making activities like this happen. We are part of a network of design factories around the globe. So this concept came out of Helsinki, Alto. Um, and really what we're about is creating a space where people can innovate. So we want to bring different types of stakeholders, different backgrounds together to be able to collaborate and apply innovation process and have the mindset to be able to engage in that. So the culture is very, very important. So we have a very low hierarchy. So we want people of all different types of backgrounds to actually talk, share knowledge, share ideas and cross-pollinate thoughts. Um, how we actually support design thinking, that mindset behind it is super, super important. So what are we? So I've said we're a space that helps to um, bring people together and do innovation, but really it's, so we've got that community building, I've covered that. We do a lot of different R&D projects for external partners, so we're applying um, different process and knowledge. And um, really, we do, and we do a lot of events like this where we're um, tailoring that knowledge to help others build capability in that area, so workshops and um, tools and other things. But really, we're a lot about students and education and how can you bring design and business and engineering together and use and draw on design thinking, design research processes, innovation tools and processes, do that in a culture that supports um, the, the working methods and the mindset and bring all those things together to come up with interesting, meaningful solutions to um, real problems for companies that centralise around people. So, we don't often actually use the term design thinking here in uh, the design factory, which is actually a misleading name. We're as much about business and entrepreneurship and engineering and other things as well. It's really about creative problem solving. So it's a different way and different mindset in how you approach something. Everyone problem solves every day in, in their work lives. But what we're doing is we're trying to take a different approach to that and draw on creative um, practices and mindsets. So prototyping is a really, really key way in which uh, we do that. So it's tangible, it's applied, it's not just about talking about different ways or ideas or people's um, whim or their innate creativity. It's about experimenting and doing and getting your hands dirty. So to capture this, really we have five principles. So rather than, we, we draw and arrange, there's so many processes already out there for design thinking. Lots of people do it, lots of people have um, put forward methods in which you can do that. And there's a lot of fantastic things that you can draw on and we um, draw on the work that other people have done. But really it's the principles and how we go about doing things and we're very much about interdisciplinarity. But these principles, 
show, um, I guess, how people should approach these tools. So the first, um, the first image is to show prototyping. It's a cardboard paper bike. Um, it's prototyping to experiment and to learn and to test and to do things really early and, and really sort of question what things could be. So this doesn't look like a typical bike. And in that process, our second principle is to fail forward and to fail fast. If you fail, that is not a bad thing. It means that you're trying, you're testing the boundaries, you're experimenting. It's only a bad thing if you don't learn anything. So if you fail, you've learnt, you've furthered knowledge and then you have a grounding to move forward and try again and work out what is going to be that final and best solution. But if you don't have space to fail, then you don't have space to innovate. So two principles, get your hands dirty, build, make things, make things real, prototype and it's okay to fail. The other is around responsibility. So your parent doesn't work here, mess, everything is, it's an open space for everyone to do whatever it is that they need to do with their projects, but ultimately people are you know, responsible themselves. So your parent doesn't work here is also really important. Safety comes first. Um, again, it's about people and it's about um, being responsible in the way that you, that you operate. It's not um, experiment at all costs. So you need to think of, of people's well-being and, and safety. And the final one is talk to a stranger. So this is really based on a serendipity model of innovation and it's that cross-pollination of ideas. Um, again, all of these things really come down to people and attitudes. So what is design thinking? Who had the chance to have a look at the links that were sent through a couple of days ago? Yeah, it's, it's quite okay if people haven't, it's just to get a, a little bit of a sense. Um, so that was a really quick snapshot of, um, I guess, Stanford and the D School There's model of um, design thinking, which gives you a little bit of a background. But quite often design thinking is associated with brainstorming and post-it notes and this way of just generating some ideas and having space to generate ideas. But it's actually a lot, lot more than that. And it's more than the processes of um, empathy and ideation and um, implementation that you would have seen in those links as well. So if we unpack the actual term design, it's really, really broad. Everything is designed. Um, design could be this pen, design might be the way that you found design factory within this building, so the signage, the wayfinding, the need finding, that's designed everything that is um, that has been constructed with intent has been designed. So it's really, really broad. Uh, and it's not just what something looks like, it's how something works, how something functions. Um, it's complex systems and services, so it can be very, very broad. Anything that is deliberate is designed. And then when you come and combine that with the thinking, the cognitive processes, so how do we actually go about deliberately constructing something? And there's all sorts of different ways that you can actually think. So combining the two together is, it's still a really broad term, design thinking. Um, but essentially what it is, what it's come from is a way um, that people are trying to frame a process or a different way of looking at the world, um, integrating intuition, integrating creativity. So it's not just about logic, um, analytics, and looking at um, information that is based around research. All that stuff is very important, but it's saying, okay, well, we've got complex problems. We need multiple viewpoints and maybe we can actually use creativity in problem solving and people's intuition, which is something that is a designer's trait as, as part of that. Um, so really, um, it is about, I guess, people as well. So design process usually puts users and people at the forefront. And that's one of the really, I think, key fundamental things around design thinking. So getting insights of what the human condition is, what are people's needs, because everything that we design, we're designing it for us, there's people in, involved. 
So why not understand their needs and their you and their their use it like what the useful things will be to them. So insight people and insights on um, what their needs are super super important and challenging. So we can all make a lot of assumptions about what that might be for other people, but is that right or not? So this um, design thinking process that Stanford have um, come up with, the D school there, starts off with empathizing. So understanding that person. So we can say, all right, um, so I need to design a drinking system for kids. I'm not a kid. I can make some assumptions about, okay, well, if it's a toddler, maybe their dexterity isn't great and um, there might need to be some accountability for that. Actually, their um, parents are probably going to be involved, how are their parents going to feel about it. So I can start to empathise with some of the human needs, but I don't actually know that. Going out and talking to those people and testing those assumptions is really important. So it's not just about creativity um, and intuition, it's about actually going and talking to people and testing what those assumptions, what your intuition and creativity is telling you. And being really um, defined about what the problem is. So if you start off with a project, um, you want to understand who are the people involved and gather some insights, test what your assumptions are, and then redefine what that problem is. Come up with ideas, um, make them tangible, and then test them. So really this process is you've got a starting point and then you're applying divergent thinking. What are the possibilities? What are the, uh, the human needs here? And then you're finding them and you're able to become more focused and say, oh, okay, well, I understand what those needs are. Actually, um, I don't need to worry about the dexterity of kids in designing this new um, drinking system because uh, it is going to be something that is used in a hospital environment where the, the kids are, have just undergone a um, operation and they're not actually going to interact and it's really about the carers and how they, um, what their needs are. So suddenly it's sort of changed around. So you've got a defined point and then you can come up with ideas again. Prototype them, test them and keep going through this iteration. So this is quite linear in terms of a process to help um, convey what it might be, but really um, there's going to be lots of iterations. So another version of this, the Paris D School, you know, understanding, observing people, so you know, interviewing, going and looking and finding out those insights, understanding their point of view, then coming up with the ideas, prototyping, testing, um, communicating that with others through storytelling, piloting that making sure that there's a business model behind things and these all tie back in. So there's all sorts of different processes and ways of mapping these things. Again, in a uh, to have a cyclic iteration, but it's still very, very similar things. You need to understand what the actual problem at hand is and what are people's needs, how do people fit into the equation, um, reframe what, the, what you are actually trying to do. Imagine, come up with the ideas, make it real, prototype, test it, depending on what you find, go through that iteration cycle again. Um, another way of framing this, uh, this is one of the um, processes we use here in one of our programs that we um, collaborate with Stanford on. And again, you know, you're defining the problem, you're looking at what's already out there, you need finding, talking to people, ideas, testing, all of that. They're all very neat and nice diagrams, but really in reality, there's, it's quite messy because you don't know what you don't know. And you're going out, you're finding things, and you're responding to that. So you can't actually know that you're going to go in this nice iterative cycle. So with design thinking, there's uncertainty and ambiguity. So this is a design squiggle. Um, Damien Newman came up with this to help describe design process. So really what you're trying to do is say, well, in order for something to be really relevant, we don't really know exactly what the parameters are. We've got a starting point and we need to do research in different ways, apply creativity um, to explore what the solution might be, knowing that in the end you will come to a point of clarity, there will be an outcome. But really that first stage, that front end, it is going, 
it's gonna, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. We don't know what that exact path is if we want to make it relevant for people and end users. Um, how the people come together, so we've talked about users unpacking um, what people's needs are, super important. But it's also really important, of course, to remember that, okay, well, if we're developing a technology, how does that fit into the, the picture and how does that relate to you know, business considerations as well? And there's, I guess this is just another way of framing um, the things that might come together for design innovation or an innovate, innovative outcome. It's not just about technology, it's not just about humans or a business model, it's all of these things intersecting and how they come together, which is where you're really going to be able to have, have impact. And I think there are many processes, there are many different tools, and we'll start to talk about those quite soon. Um, but really, it's the principles. Uh, this is taken um, from a design management um, article and, and different people's ideas on what design thinking is. So we've got different design disciplines, okay? But then, you know, strategies, systems, services, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to, you know, plenty of, you don't need to be a designer to do design thinking because it's really about that approach. Empathy, creativity, efficiency, iteration, invention. So it's the mindset and the principles and you can pick and choose any kind of method and framework for going about it, but it's how you approach it that really makes that difference, so that mindset. So um, understanding the process, being mindful of it, um, being very deliberate in crafting um, clarity around what the task is through insights, but being active, showing, uh, not telling, prototyping, doing, experimenting, embracing uncertainty, being empathetic, understanding human values. So empathy is super crucial and super key uh, to that. And that's something that we'll be focusing on today. So as I mentioned, there's a huge number of different tools out there. So Frog um, are another consultancy that are renowned for design thinking and design research and innovation. They have the CAT action map so these are things you can go up and look at in more detail later on. Um, IDEO, which are closely linked, another um, international consultancy that's linked in with Stanford, who are probably one of the founders of design thinking as a framework, have multiple tools that can be uh, drawn on. Um, there's the bootcamp, bootleg, dschool, um, cards that the mapping that you guys um, were sent the link to is based on huge number. There's um, strategizer are really great from an entrepreneurship's viewpoint. So there's business model canvases and value proposition canvases. There's all different sorts of tools that you can draw on to really um, employ design thinking approaches. And different ones will be appropriate depending on what you um, are trying to apply it to. So I'm gonna skip through a few slides here and I'll come back. But really, depending on where you want to apply design thinking, is it to this entire process? Uh, so the commercialization or the translation process of, of early research for commercialization, <coughs> you could apply it to the entire process. You could apply it to different stages and different tasks and the sorts of um, tools that you might use will vary. And there's a lot of them out there. So a business model canvas for example, might make perfect sense um, up here when we're looking at uh, launching, but it also might make perfect sense at the beginning so that you know by the time you get to the end, the stuff that you're doing is actually going to be um, make commercial sense. So there's a lot of variance. Um, a few examples of, um, I guess, design thinking in practice. I'll skip through this one. Um, Plan Mecca are a um, dental company that have in-house designers because they um, have the idea that their competitive advantage is through understanding how people will interact with dental products and the, the space. So they've come up, they use design thinking to um, come up with all of their products. So at the moment they're launching a, a new way of um, taking uh, x-rays and scans that's comfortable. So that's a result of doing user research and finding out you know, what, the, the, what the real pains are of people going to the dentist so they can 
start to develop products that people don't mind interacting with. And if you're a, a dentist or you've got a business in that area, hey, you're going to go to the products that are going to draw people to have a good experience when they come to visit you. Um, and another example of design thinking in practice was NetMedi. So they um, were founded basically on, on design thinking. They went, all right, so we know that um, cancer treatment patients, there's all sorts of issues in their experience of um, treatment and medication prescription and other things. So they use design thinking to talk to people, to go and observe and look at how things happened. And they went, ah, oh, OK, there's all these different channels in which um, information is captured. And, and um, some people will write stuff down. Some people will email, all these different channels. Let's come up with a way of keeping everything in the one place. It's going to make sense for patients. Um, it's got to be easy to use for clinical staff. And they've come up with um, this I guess, data package, which has applications as part of that, um, to have a more holistic um, product that allows for better patient treatment. So that's really coming out of understanding people and what their needs are. Um, another project that Paulina actually uh, did a lot of research around was for a, a pharmaceutical company, Orion, who was or not, it came from a pharmaceutical company, Orion, but it was a conglomerate of a number of different organisations coming together um, to develop technology around blood testing or blood sampling. And they sort of said, OK, well, let's get some researchers in because we think we need design expertise to um, work out how this is going to actually be implemented because they were focusing just on the technology. Um, and really what they found was they should have integrated it earlier because it was wonderful that they identified that, but they were so far into their technology development that some of the insights they found about user need, they went, oh, actually, we can't, we can't implement this. So that was a really interesting one in, in reflection on actually showing the value of um, design coming on board nice and early. Um, another project where um, design thinking was involved was for um, a company, Philips. So we had a team of, of students from different discipline backgrounds, business engineering design coming together. They were given the task of designing a cooling pad. And I was like, OK, well, we can do that, but why are we doing this? All right, so it was for this one particular um, application where um, sonic frequency is applied um, for uh, treatment of breast cancer and a couple of other um, specialised, um, a few specialised treatments. And it's a super, super uncomfortable procedure for people because their skin heats up. There's about you know, 20 to 30 minutes of high food treatment, ultrasonic treatment, but they're in this thing for about two and a half hours because they have to have all these pauses for their skin to cool. So as soon as the team realised that, okay, well, they sort of went, observed, understood the user viewpoint. Oh, right, so we know how we can actually go about designing this cooling pad. OK, it's going to go into this machine, can't have wires, it's going to be on someone for two hours. OK, great. And so they came up with something that used phase change material and that's now sort of been rolled out and implemented. So there's a couple of examples of how it can actually help shape the end outcome of um, a product to make something successful. What we're going to do today is really focus around that first stage of empathy and understanding people and humans and some of the tools around that. So I will stop talking and hand you now over to Paulina. Ironically, although we talk about design thinking, design thinking actually it's all about doing. So the main thing is that it's iterative and you learn by doing. So what we get you to do is, as Christine mentioned, um, we really try to understand who is your end user. So um, related to your research, uh, what is the, let's say, end product or service? Who is that person using actually some of your research or um, the technology you actually are doing research on? So we'll do um, four different 
tasks. First one is identifying challenges. And we were actually struggling, we thought of actually assigning you a design challenge. But as you all come from very different backgrounds and different type, you do different types of research, so we actually get you to identify different types of uh, design opportunities and challenges. So that's the first stage. Next one is once you know your challenge and your user, then you start building uh, a persona around that. So you build a profile, then you start empathizing with that person. So what do they see? What do they feel? What do they say and do in a particular context? And finally, based on that understanding and empathizing with the user, do you actually have to reframe the issue? So as Christine mentioned earlier, uh, design thinking um, does a lot of work on first the problem space. First, we actually need to understand the problems and identify them really well so that we can ask the right questions so that we can actually solve uh, those problems and, and come up with solutions that actually matter. Uh, so the final task is then to reframing your original challenge based on the insights. So what I would like to do is actually get you involved in sharing the personas that you came up with. So that first sheet that outlines um, who the person is, what is the context, what is the, um, what is the problem, and then some pains, gains, insights and any reframing of the problem. So if you could share a quick summary of what that is with the rest of the group, that would be wonderful. So we might start here and work our way around the room. So our key user are scientists, namely ourselves. So we've collectively named ourselves as Joe. Um, the problem that we identified is science is very inefficient. Um, certain tasks, for example, pipetting into 96 well plates, repetitive tasks that could be done better, um, whether it be by better design pipettes that allow you to do it in one click versus 96 times, um, better strategies with how we manage our time, for example, if we just took a week to kind of think and reframe how we manage our projects, we could be more productive. Uh, key insights are we are very unhappy and stressed and very frustrated. Um, we are all, we care a lot about doing science, but we feel like there are a lot of barriers in the way of achieving that. And the, the reframed issue, I guess, is can we be more productive with our time via design of better scientific tools or better workflow management to help change the world? Great, so it wasn't just about that one tool, that same pains and, and frustrations is applied to a range of different tasks and things. So it's yeah. actually a broader question it's a bigger to look at. Picture. So I guess if we were starting a company, this would be a product we'd sell, the multi the ninety six well multi channel, whatever, but then we'd be looking at to other identifying other problems that cause the same sort of feelings in the in the scientist and go from there. Uh, our persona was quite broad. Um, we called him Dazza. <laughs> he was uh, 45, lives rurally and has a young boy in this case who's sick and needs to go to hospital. So um, our context was um, children's hospital and potentially developing something to make it much easier for people to find their way around the hospitals and um, be able to find their children as well, potentially. Um, so our um, Dazza in the context of the children's hospital um, is obviously quite stressed, overwhelmed, emotionally on edge, you know, doesn't, has stress enough driving through the city, trying to find parking, cost of parking, um, all that stuff. There's, you know, lots of people rushing around announcements um, and some of the things that he's even sort of subliminally thinking, you know, he's got that on top, is my child going to be all right? Um, and um, yeah, keeping track of his child. So he's obviously got a lot of pain, stress, uncertainty, um, exacerbating hospital fear, um, and then, so then potentially turning some of those pains into gains with the product that we're looking at, um, being able to decrease stress, decrease uncertainty, and then improve the overall hospital um, experience, and therefore having a bit of a, um, yeah, improvement for the hospital itself, as opposed to, so we've got our patient, well, our persona, and then also the hospital. So, however, when we were re when we were kind of looking at insights and sort of looking to reframe our challenge a little bit, we were then looking at not only our persona, but also our key stakeholder in our hospital. And we were looking at it from two different points of view. And obviously, 
when we're talking about IDEO, they're a consultancy, they get brought a problem and they get brought on to do that problem from the whole way through. And we kind of then thought, well, what if we're an entrepreneur who's developing this technology with the end user, but then we're then going to have to sell it to a hospital. So we were kind of looking at our two, then looking at two end users and kind of realising that it's, it was great to be able to look through all this, but sometimes it's a little bit more complex, I think, than what we thought. So that was about it. Um, and we have identified our problem, and the problem is tuberculosis, the disease, and going deeper, the major problem is drug resistance. Um, we ha and drug resistance is defined by the fact that you might give a first line of um, treatment to a TB patient, but eventually, or it doesn't treat them, they might have a strain of bacteria that um, will not be treated. With this first line of drug, you have to go through various um, lines of um, treatment before you can find something that will treat them if that even works. Um, so our user for this problem, we have identified the doctor and he is Dr Nguyen from a small town in Vietnam. Um, he is busy, he's time poor, he's 45 years old with a wife and three kids and he's got elderly parents at home. Um, what does he... Oh, some of the pains and gains that he has, he has a lot of stress, um, probably from seeing um, a lot of sick patients who are always coughing, sputum, blood, um, whole shebang. Um, he's frustrated and feels powerless because he can't um, treat these patients. And imagine in a small town, he's probably the savior for these people um, because they have nowhere else to turn to. Um, and there's a demanding workload because these patients keep coming back. You can't kind of discharge them and never see them again because they, their disease is just not treated. Um, some of the gains that he might have is from um, seeing patients get well um, and successful treatment. And probably we also identified that um, some of the things that he might do in this predicament is that he might look bring other doctors or seek advice from bigger cities in Vietnam um, or do some online research and from that maybe he will get some gains from hearing success stories of um, treatment. Um, what do we want to achieve? We want to achieve patient wellness and cure. And so as a researcher, initially we started with wanting to come up with the miracle drug for um, drug resistant TB. But actually, in going through and sitting in the shoes of Dr. Nguyen, we felt that um, the problem actually is closely linked to the diagnosis of um, drug-resistant bacteria as well. So if he's able to quickly um, figure out if this bacteria is going to be, or this patient has the drug-resistant strain of TB, um, maybe he'll be um, much better at picking the appropriate drug that will treat that drug resistance. So it's, I guess, diagnosis and cure goes hand in hand. And in reassessing the whole process, we realize that we can't just focus on the cure, but actually we need to give our user a cheat sheet or something um, more, yeah, a cheat sheet to be able to go through and quickly identify what's the most appropriate treatment. Yeah, you've done an extremely good job of engaging with the activities. So. Congratulations and uh, thank you for being present.